Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I am an author and robot. It's 2021. I still consider it 2020 because it's a disaster, absolute disaster area, but you know, we're here. Uh, and we're stuck in it together until uh, we're not. And so hopefully we're stuck in it together for a while. Or we actually just move on to 2021 for reals. Because if for some reason one of us is stuck here and the other one isn't, that's usually not a good sign. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Let's talk in some, some creative news and some information today. Because there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. Um, two not so great, and then one that maybe will hopefully help authors out, especially indie authors, in the coming years. But before we get started, you know the drill. Lemoy, enter the regular writing contest. It's not really a contest, it's just kind of a submission thing here on the channel where we read your work at the beginning of every month and if you want to check out what that's like there will be a playlist at the end of this video that you should totally check out because it is so delightful and I get to practice my reading skills while being completely delighted so check out the prompt for February and maybe consider submitting question mark and from there if you like what I do on this channel like subscribe share and uh, meet me on alternative platforms also like BitChute, Minds, Gab, you know, the place, and uh, we can talk. Those will all be linked. Um, my usernames and stuff will all be linked down in the description below. And the final thing is, if you haven't read my debut novel, Dead End Drive, it's available. It's hilarious. Get it today. So, without further ado, I know, great sales pitch, right? People die, it's hilarious. <laughs> what else do you need? So, without further ado, let's get into the stories of the day. There's kind of some serious stuff going on. So the first story that I want to talk about is from the Wall Street Journal here, and it's even Homer gets mobbed. Massachusetts school has banned the Odyssey. So we've been talking about censorship for a while on this channel, and it's one of the reasons why I started this channel was to talk about the, the censorship and the bullying and the honestly the anti-creative culture that's going on in the writing industry right now and especially the mainstream writing industry and what happens on twitter which don't get me started on twitter but this has been going and it's not just twitter because you can see this and i've watched this happen in the publishing industry for years agenting and querying and stuff had always made me super depressed to go and look at the anti-intellectual anti-creative stuff that was going on and it's only gotten worse over the years as now they're not looking for creativity they're not looking for stories they're looking for the correct demographics to publish over everything else and they're cutting out stories with meaning and when it comes to this, sorry, I forgot, to, I forgot to switch the window, so now you'll see the article that I was talking about. When it comes to creativity, when it comes to storytelling, it's not the messenger that the stories are in. We should be reading what the stories are about, and this goes back to the Jessica Cluis stuff where she got canceled for talking back to these anti-intellectual, anti-creative people that wanted to cancel classics by misinterpreting them and then claiming that they mean something that they don't. You know... When No One Is Watching is a much more racist book than any of the stories that uh, What's-Her-Face listed. German, I, what, I, ger whatever her name was, whatever. We're going to get into this, this article and then we can talk more about censorship. But it has been a main thing on this channel for a while because the gatekeepers, as they call themselves, including Miss P.S. Uh, literary senior agent over there, who specifically says we are choosing who sits at the table we are the gatekeepers but then also follows up with a post saying hey we are not allowing certain demographics to apply for uh jobs with us so i see what you're doing over there anyway let's get started on this article before dropping too much shade even homer gets mobbed the Wall Street Journal writes, A sustained effort is underway to deny children access to literature. Under the slogan, Disrupt Text, Critical Theory Ide Ideologues, school teachers, 
Critical theory ideologues, school teachers, and Twitter agitators are purging and propagandizing against classic texts, everything from Homer to F. Scott Fitzgerald to Dr. Seuss. Their ethos holds that children shouldn't have to read stories written by anything other than the present day vernacular, especially those in which racism, sexism, ableism, anti Semitism, and other forms of hate are the norm, as young adult novelist Padma. Ben Katraman writes in School Library Journal, no author is valuable enough to spare, Miss Venkatraman instructs, absolving Shakespeare of responsibility by mentioning that he lived in a time when hate-ridden sentiments prevailed, risks sending a subliminal message that academic excellence outweighs hateful rhetoric. So first I gotta pause on this, which um, you can't hold people of the past by current day standards because there was different morality, especially when we talk about 50 years ago, breaking we don't have the same morality and and senses whatever that we had 10 years ago that we had 20 years ago what are you doing going back like five six seven hundred years i know shakespeare's not just just get with me and saying we need to hold people to the account of what we believe is moral now people have changed societies have changed but aside from that this shows a complete lack of understanding of how history works so after the fall of nazi germany and i hate to bring up the Holocaust because it's always mentioned so, so often in order to manip manipulate people. But this needs to be heard. After the Holocaust ended, after World War II, it shouldn't be the after the Holocaust ended, but after World War II, America and other countries flew Nazi scientists out of Germany and gave them jobs in local countries to continue their experiments because their information and their experimentation was so valuable. So yes, ideology is often overlooked for academic excellence, for information, for scientific background. This is not something new and I'm not even comparing Shakespeare or Dr. Seuss to Nazi Germany scientists, but there has never been a time when excellent writing or information has not been taught because the person was a human or evil in some cases or doing evil things. How about that? How about we say it that way? This is just a blatant censorship. This is also a way to try and sell authors books. So don't think that this is much more moral than it actually is. This is an individual group or, or a couple of people on a moral high ground high horse that are also trying to say, look, we're going to discontinue selling the, teaching these books to children that do have a purpose, that do have bigger lessons in them in order to only teach present day books. They're, they're setting up a system so that they can force schools to purchase their books en masse to make them money. That is something that happens with this situation. The article continues, the subtle complexities of literature are being reduced to the crude clanking of intersectional power struggles. Thus, Seattle, thus Seattle English teacher Evan Shin tweeted in 2018 that he'd rather die than teach the Scarlet Letter unless Nathan, Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel is used to fight against misogyny and slut shaming. Again, sounds like a complete misreading of what that book is actually about. Anyone that calls themselves a teacher and doesn't know how to critically read actual texts and also separate the text from the author, the ideas in the text from the author, the ideas of a character from the author, needs some clinical help. Brett Easton Ellis is not Patrick Bateman, and the actions that Patrick Bateman takes in his book are not there because Brett Easton Ellen, uh, Ellis approves of what Patrick Bateman is doing. In fact, if you read any of, of um, Brett Easton Ellis's interviews about prepare, preparation for writing Patrick Bateman or about what it was like writing Patrick Bateman, he talks about all of the gruesome research that he had to do on different on serial killings and the details of all that and how crazy and insane and just grotesque it felt. Just because you write a bad guy character does not mean that you agree with what that character is doing. And I'm going to come back to this. Don't let me forget that I'm going to come back to this. Outsiders got a glimpse of the intensity of the Disrupt Text campaign recently when self-described anti-racist Lorena German, that's what I was talking about before, complained that many classics were written more than 70 years ago. Quote, think of us 
Think of U.S. society before then and the values that shaped this nation afterwards. That is what is in those books. Jessica Cluis, an author of young adult fiction, shot back, if you think Hawthorne was on the side of the judgmental Puritans, then you are an idiot and should not have the title of educator in your Twitter bio. Completely agree with that. If you are misreading stuff on purpose and mislabeling characters' intentions or authors' intentions, you're a bad person and you should not be an educator. If you're not a bad person, then you're just an uncritical, unsmart reader and you shouldn't be educating people. An online horde descended, accused Miss Clewis of racism and violence and demanded that Penguin Random House cancel her contract. The publisher hasn't complied, perhaps because Miss Clewis tweeted a ritual self-denunciation, -de quote, I take full responsibility for my unprovoked anger towards Lorena German. I am committed to learning more about Miss German's, it might be Germain's, important works with disrupt texts. I will strive to do better. That didn't stop Miss Clewis's literary agent, Brooks Sherman, a cuck, from denouncing her racist and unpredictable opinions and terminating their personal relationships because he's a cuck. The demands for censorship appear to be getting results. Be like Odysseus and embrace the long haul to liberation and then take the Odyssey out of your curriculum because it's trash, tweeted Shea Martin in June. Hello, who are you? It's trash? You mean like when no one is watching level trash? You mean like probably whatever you write level trash? Can we stop? You are nowhere near, let's just say, you are nowhere near the expertise, and I don't even have to like Odyssey, but you are nowhere near the expertise that it takes to create a book such as the Odyssey that lasts millennia, that speaks to the human condition, that the human journey. For you to call it trash is for you to be unfit to be an educator, and I don't take that back. Ha ha, replied Heather Levine, an English teacher at Lawrence, Massachusetts High School. Very proud to say that we got Odyssey removed from the curriculum last year. <laughs> when I contacted Miss Levine to confirm this, she replied that she found the inquiry invasive. So she's bragging about it, but then when somebody from a journal asks for her for more information, she's like, ew, why are you talking to me? You're a coward, Levine. The English department chairman of Lawrence Public Schools, Richard Goman, didn't respond to emails. They're all cowards. All they do is they grab power and then they force stuff on you, brag about how incredibly brave they are, but then when anybody tries to talk to them, they're like, help me, help me, I'm scared. It's a tragedy that this anti-intellectual movement of canceling the classics is gaining traction among educators in the mainstream publishing industry, says science fiction writer John Del Arose, one of the rare industry voices to defend Miss Clewis. Erasing the history of great works only limits the ability of children to become literate. He's right. If there is harm in classic literature, it comes from not teaching it. Students excused from reading foundational texts may imagine themselves lucky to get away with YA novels instead. That's, and you cannot even compare YA novels to the Odyssey. Sorry, but you can't. You can have great YA novels, whatever, but you cannot compare them to the Odyssey. There is not the same amount of thought in them as in the Odyssey. There is not the same amount of philosophy in them as in the Odyssey. And I'm sorry, they're just not as difficult or as as life-changing or as mental as the Odyssey. And that's the most ludicrous thing, really, is all these people that are teachers, teachers, educators, <laughs> think that they can just replace classical literature that is philosophical and deep and thoughtful with YA, present-day YA stuff, and it is no big deal. Mm, they want you dumb. They want you dumb so they can beat you like sheep. Remember that. They want you dumb, um, submissive, and eventually dead. That's what the disrupt text people want. But compared with their better educated peers, they will suffer a poverty of language and cultural references. Worse, they won't even know it. I appreciate you, Megan Cox Gurdon, for writing this article and for also pushing back because this is an important subject. And so I'm going to come back up here. Like I said, I didn't want to forget what I was saying with, um, when you write a character, it doesn't mean that you agree with what they're saying. So Ethan Van Skyver, and I'm probably going to mention this forever because it's brilliant. Comic Pro, Ethan Van Skyver mentioned on a live stream a couple weeks back how the, the masculine mind tends to be able to put on a persona that's unlike themselves, but the feminine mind is unable to do that and just has to project themselves onto everything around them. So a way of explaining this would be Imagine a boy child, and it's this isn't specifically boy or girl, okay? You can have 
girls that have the masculine mind and boys that have the feminine mind. That's how you get the soys. But we're going to keep it with masculine and feminine right now just to make sure that we've got that clear differentiation. So the masculine mind, imagine he's playing with Batman toy. Now he is not the Batman. He does not have the same personality as the Batman, the child. He does not have the same background as the Batman, but the boy child with the masculine mentality can pick up that Batman and put on that Batman persona. So he actively starts seeing the world as the Batman. He starts embodying the traits of the Batman, the habits of the Batman, the background of the Batman, and he acts like the Batman. Now the feminine mind is unable to put on that persona of somebody else, and instead they can only project themselves onto whatever they're looking at. So when they pick up that Batman toy, the feminine mind will project their feelings, their thoughts, their background, their personality, their habits onto the Batman, and effectively they turn Batman into an avatar of themselves. So when I see these people that assume the author is exactly like or agrees with the characters in their novels, I can only assume that this is a feminine minded person that projects themselves into everything that they do. So they cannot possibly imagine what it is like to write somebody that you don't necessarily agree with or to read somebody that you don't necessarily agree with because they cannot actually create a character that does not agree with them. And I see this all over the place. It's these usually leftists and left-minded people who cannot for the life of them imagine writing a character that does not have their values, that does not have their personality, that does not look like them, that actually might do things that they do not agree with on a deep personal level, but make that person sympathetic, make that person one of your main characters, make that person believe that they are correct in what they're doing and continue to think about, you know, it's not good personally, but you're writing this character to be empathetic to this character. You don't have to like what they're doing. And this is a really, really big divide that I think is definitely all over the creative community. And it's one of the things that's separating, especially left and right people. And we're in this new place of left and right where it's not really political anymore. It's really just hive mind versus not hive mind. And that's why you've ended up getting the walk away movement and many of the LGBT communities moving over to the right. They don't have politically right values, but right now it's freedom and tyranny. That is what the two sides stand for is freedom and tyranny. Anyway, the lack of empathy is on the left side. All they can do is project and all they can do is assume that you are exactly as your character's right. And that's also why I can only assume people, some, somebody in my reviews <laughs> saw my poor, poor beautician make a comment at my poor, poor doctor and they could only assume that those were my thoughts. Mm. I hope you get some help in separating characters from uh, from the people. Anyway, so there is that. And uh, moving on with censorship from moving on from the Odyssey and Homer to modern day censorship is Simon and Schuster. Maybe you heard of this. Simon and Schuster cancels Josh Hawley's book deal after what happened at the Capitol on the sixth of January. I'm going to wait to say something until we read this. On Wednesday, Missouri Republican Josh Hawley called a vote to object to Joe Biden's election victory, raised a fist to Trump supporters outside the Capitol and fundraised on a charge to fight for free and fair elections while a mob was inside the Capitol violently living out his theatrical efforts to stop a peace, the peaceful transfer of power. Can we just talk about how loaded that opening sentence is? MSN. What the frick? Calm down the rhetoric and you're painting, painting your fantasy. On the Thursday, Simon & Schuster canceled that June publication of Holly's forthcoming book, The Tyranny of Big Tech. How ironic. How ironic. After witnessing the disturbing, deadly insurrection that took place on Wednesday in Washington, D.C., Simon & Schuster has decided to cancel the publication of Senator Josh Hawley's forthcoming book, the publisher one of the Big Five, which is now the Big Four, remaining in the U.S., said in a statement, quote, We did not come to this decision lightly. As a publisher, it will always be our mission to amplify a variety of voices and viewpoints. Kind of seems like they, uh... Talk, they're talking on both sides of their mouth right now. Oh, we like all view, we like we like a variety of viewpoints, but we're not doing this one. Okay, you should have stuck to your guns. 
At the same time, we take seriously our, our, our large public responsibility as citizens and cannot support Senator Hawley after his role in what became of a dangerous threat. I hope Simon & Schuster has never published a true crime novel because they have likely inspired serial killers or at least one-time killers that then got caught because they published novels, right? That's how this works, right? Because you published content that is uh, kind of spooky, you're to blame for anybody that might be inspired by the content that you publish. This is, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, this is a terrible precedent to set that you will only publish people with whom you agree. And then you will accuse anybody that you won't, and then you'll accuse anybody that you don't agree with as, um, being insiders of some kind of violence. Holly described the move taken by the private company as Orwellian, a direct assault on the First Amendment and an example of cancel culture. I love how they pretend that those aren't real things. And I'm not gonna read any more of this article because of the MSN just being so loaded with vitriol that you get the gist of it. I don't really care about the rest. Um, but it's very funny because in the aftermath of this, I have seen so many authors, authors and like small publishers and agents applauding this and going LMAO, I don't think this guy knows even what Orwellian is. I even saw one person that said something about how the entire GOP and specifically Josh Hawley would be villains in Orwell's novels if Orwell were alive today. And all I can think of is, have you ever read anything other than Harry Potter? Have you ever actually read any of George Orwell's books? And if you have, do you have the mental capacity to actually understand them? because Animal Farm is inspired by the Soviet Union. Napoleon the Pig, which, and you can listen to the whole, the whole thing of Animal Farm on this channel, I did a reading of it, it's pretty great. But Animal Farm is inspired by the Soviet Union. Napoleon the Pig is Stalin. George Orwell was a socialist, but he believed in people living better lives. He, he was not for tyranny and censorship. Those were big problems with him. He also had big problems with government control. So he was a soldier and for some time, 1984, the main components of it were inspired by one, the time he was stationed in Burma and had to watch the caste and surf system, party system over there and how it controlled everything. He hated that. That was something he actually witnessed. The caste system and the party system that is present in 1984 was something that he witnessed while placed in Burma. Another thing that he took inspiration from in real life was when he was stationed in Spain and watching the way that the Spanish political system removed the ability of the people to defend themselves of the militia and disempowered the average person of their own protections. And then the third thing that inspired that heavily inspired 1984 was the censorship that went on at the BBC. He had friends who worked for the BBC, that is the newspaper in main newspaper, country newspaper, whatever, um, national newspaper in the UK that he watched them delete information, black out information hide information from being published in the newspapers because they were told to. George Orwell was highly against censorship of information, was highly against closing off voices. And so when you get these people that go, ha 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 ha, your voice was just pulled and you would be a bad guy in Orwell, all I could say is, you are the party and you have never read 1984. Maybe put down Harry Potter, which you probably read, you know, like 15 years ago when it was fresh and you haven't read a book since but actually use your mind. And if you have read this book, you are completely disingenuous and you are acting out of evil. Stop making this a party affi affiliation thing. We should all, as creatives, you are a sham on creatives, on creativity, on the creative community. If you are applauding the silencing of another one of your peers, and you don't even have to like all of your peers. I certainly don't like every single writing community peer, but I don't have to. To, to hope that they can have just as much an opportunity to have their voices heard as I have for mine, right? We should all be hoping, should be praying, should be working for an open publication system that allows for the brightest ideas, for the best ideas, for even, not even the best ideas, but how about some controversial ideas to make it into the sunlight where they can be discussed and they can be scrutinized for their intellectual value. The people that applaud this sort of action and that try to turn censorship into some sort of party game are despicable.
And I see you all over the place, on the left, on Twitter. You are the reason that the writing community on Twitter is so toxic. If it's not about canceling people, it's all about the writer's lift, where nobody doing the writer's lift cares about anybody else doing the writer's lift. They generally don't care about what you're writing about because they're not a fans of your work. They never read your work. They just want the numbers so they can use the numbers to say, hey, look, agent, I have a following. It's all a scam. Anyway, you're a shame. It is Orwellian to cut people out for their opinions. That is what is happening. Read 1984. Holy crap. Are you serious? <sighs> On a lighter note, <laughs> the last topic of today, I know, it's time, right? Top 10 publishing trends every author needs to know, and this is from the written word media. Let me just be honest with you, I don't know how what the reputation of written word media is, but I thought it was interesting for us to talk about anyway, to keep our eyes open, our minds open for what might actually be helpful in the coming year. So publishing and publishing trends, a uh, number one trend that they bring up is more traditional authors will move to indie model. And I can actually see this happening with, there are so many more traditionally published authors who are kind of doing a hybrid where they're traditionally published and indie published. And that means a lot, in my opinion, for indie publishing, because you're going to start getting uh, more credibility for indie publishing as traditional published authors go to indie publishing. So that can bring everybody up. That also, mean, no, that, that also means that you, indie authors, need to be on your best, most professional behavior when publishing your books, you want to shoot for indie, um, you want to shoot for industry standard because you don't want somebody to know, be able to tell the difference in quality between um, big publisher or indie publisher. So check on your formatting, check on your typeface, check on your layout, check on um, the pages that are on the inside. Also check on, uh, you, you know, like the title, the copyright, the blah, 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 and check on your cover, make sure, and editing also the editing make sure you go through as many of these as you can and bring up so you go from self-publishing which is the bottom to indie publishing which get, has some level of reputation and with the traditional artists more coming down to do both there will be much more reputation in indie publishing so do your part and make sure your work is ready for indie publishing before you put it out there okay this is your responsibility I'm trusting every last one of you do the work to get yourself to indie standard or to industry standard. This is how we change how people feel about um, indie publishing. Trend number two in publishing is that more indie authors will collaborate or consolidate in collectives. This is one of the, th and I can believe this is happening because this is one of the things that I have been talking about. Let's do it. Let's do. And it's one of the things that I've been trying to do with the writing community on Parlor, with the writing community on Ruckus, with wherever I can connect with writing community people. And it's one of the reasons why I've pushed to try to start my own press and I'm working uh, kind of on that in the funding department. I could probably fi try to figure out more ways to do funding so that I could get more stuff rolling but we need and i've been saying this for a while we need a literary renaissance which is going to change the face of publishing in one way it's going to change the face of publishing with indie publishing being brought up to the next level and i'm also thinking uh i've got some ideas to help with navigating indie publishing that can help change that but collectives for indie publisher uh, indie publishers indie authors is going to be very important for us to trust each other for us to help lift each other up and we need to do it genuinely and we need to believe in the books and the products and the stories that we are telling and the authors that we are working with. So consolidation and collectives I definitely see because the big five is becoming the big four and we need more avenues and authors are starting to care more about authors and getting that middleman of the publisher out of here. So again, industry standard industry professional and actually care about your fellow author that you're trying to connect with and don't just use them for connections or assistance build real relationships and we're going to have something going on here believe me the big players a trend another trend that uh, written word talks about is that authors will benefit from competition in ebook marketplace between apple amazon and google amazon is the largest retailer for indies but in 2020 we saw signs that two other major tech players are in interested in competing for authors. In spring 2020, Apple announced a redesign to its author portal and revealed that they have made it easier for authors without a Mac to publish with iBooks. So pretty much all of the 
the three mega corporations for ebooks are going to be competing with each other to get more authors. Um, Amazon has not really been very nice to indie publishers, <laughs> specifically with Aud the way they treated Audible. So just be careful, read the fine print on everything that you're doing as you look at your options. And um, know that the big publisher, the big, big corporations are fighting for your attention, your content right now, because they want your content to make them money. Trend number four in the big players is more platforms fighting for audio supremacy that will benefit savvy authors. So again, people are going to be fighting for your content to make them big money. Again, review the information, keep track. And once you publish with people like Audible, like wherever the other players are, try to follow the creative news and see if there is anything going on that you might not follow. It might not be something that you can do on the regular, but just try to follow information going in and out and around this stuff to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of in the case that you have books on the market. In the ebook market territory, another trend is COVID-19 will impact book sales in different ways at different times. I'm not really sure what this means. Let's see, let's let's find out. COVID-19 has had a major impact on the ebook market. 2020 saw more people turn to books for at-home entertainment and education via digital means. Publish Drive has experienced a surge in digital book sales since the outbreak of the pandemic. We expect that surge in book sales will continue in the first half of 2021. However, the second half of the year could mark a downturn for ebook sales if vaccination efforts in the US and Europe are successful. As people are able to leave their houses and once again embark on travel, people will have less time or inclination to read and could buy fewer books. So lockdowns led to more book sales and if lockdowns and book sales might go down, I guess. Trend number six, the overall ebook market will continue to grow because people want to have books on them. So even if the book's sales move up and down at different times, the ebook sales will likely still grow. I personally prefer um, non-digital copies, though I am slightly reading more digital copies at the time, especially for books that are harder to find. Uh, you'll you'll hear about some of those books in the future whenever I get time to actually read them. But any book that I actually do like, or or if I'm reading it for the first time, like with indie authors, I will buy a physical copy to read it. And um, if it's not for me, I will usually donate the book when I'm done. And if it is that bad, sometimes I don't pass them on. Anyway, growth growth in the ebook market. It looks like. Another trend is that authors will see more success with international sales. Ricardo Fayette of Readsy is optimistic about the growth of ebook market in Europe. One thing the pandemic has greatly developed is the ebook market in the European countries that so were so far viewed as extremely traditional in their book buying habits. Whenever, whatever the evolution of the pandemic, I can only see this trend further developing, especially in the first months of the year when all the Christmas presents Kindle devices need to be loaded up with books. So more book sales. And then in the marketing area for book trends, it will be a volatile tile. It will be a volatile year for paid advertising. COVID has accelerated the shift to digital among all industries, not just books. That means more retailers and brands will spend more marketing dollars in digital channels in 2021. Increased spending and competition will drive up the costs of digital advertising for authors. So if you're advertising, if you're paying for ads, for your book, they may go up this year as you compete more with other businesses that are also now competing for the same ad space they weren't using before. Authors should be prepared to see higher ad costs in 2021, but also stay abreast of these events that may not rise. Number nine is that email delivery and engagement will become a focus for authors. Authors will become even more dependent on their email list due to the rocky ad landscape. but. The advent of new email services for users and continued gating by email by Gmail will make it harder to reach them, those users who have subscribed to authors lists. Add that to the growing email volume due to generalized shift to digital due to COVID. The bright side, it's harder than ever to get someone's attention with an email, but when you have a reader's email address, you own a direct line to them. So there is that. And finally, the last trend written, written word media brings to us is that authors who write into series and with a big backlist will win larger pieces of the pie. And this is usually because if you bring one pers a person in with your one book and they are at least okay with that book or interested in your point of view or interested in that story, they're going to buy your whole backlog. They're going to buy everything in that series. And that's usually why 
it's suggested that authors write a whole bunch and then have that backlog, have that series group, because readers are more likely to just buy out everything an author has. A 2020 author survey that Written Word Media did showed that having more published books is a major drive of author income. So, with an ebook market growing quickly, authors with a large backlist are best poised to take advantage right away. If that backlist is made of a series, it's even better. Series are very convincing, specifically for readership. Those authors can expect even more read throughs and more purchases of an entire series up front. Richie Woolman, Written Word Media, predicts more authors will focus on growing their catalog to reap marketing and earning efficiencies. There is a formula for success and higher earnings as an indie author. Authors who follow the formula are winning, and we expect more to follow suit. In 2021, we will, be, we will continue to see how the pandemic impacts self-publishing industry. We've learned in a lot of 20, and we've learned a lot in 2020, but 2021. We'll hopefully see another major change if the spread of the virus is reduced. What trends? And this article and the article finishes with what trends do you see coming in 2021? Do you disagree or agree with anything above? I would love to know that as well in the comments down below. So let me th know what you think on the trends. If there was a trend that you completely disagree with, if there's a trend that wasn't even listed that you can definitely see coming, let me know because I could use some of that advice. Like seriously. <laughs> I know, I'm already working on the backlog. I just, I, it takes time to get a book ready to go. I'm telling you. Industry standard. That is going to change the indie industry. Anyway, that is, is what I have for you today. Let me, you know, let me know your thoughts on any of the articles, one of the articles, all of the articles, all of your thoughts. And if you have anything that you'd like to see me cover in the future, I would love to hear from you. Hit me up on any social media. Again, Parlor, Gab, Minds. Um, my website, you can send me a direct email and sign up for the mailing list. I don't think I've ever used the mailing list, but for future books, if you'd like to be on a reading list or to know when more projects of mine are coming out, that might be the way to do it. I'm not very good at that yet. I know. What kind, what kind of author am I that I don't use email lists? A terrible one. That's, that's the type. <laughs> so much so much stuff to keep track of anyway that's everything that i have to say this time remember if you like this sort of content like it share it subscribe it it really helps me out to know what you guys enjoy and also the algorithms the mythical super mythical algorithms i don't know how they work um until next time i guess talk to you soon have a good weekend and uh don't die dear madam astra that's me. We regret to inform you that on August 1st, your employer, Agatha Jane Benedict, owner of the Benedict Estate, peacefully passed away in her sleep. Oh, that's so sad. Wait, 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 wait. Let me try that again. <clears throat> oh. oh, my goodness. That's so sad. Yeah, I think I'm ready. With millions of dollars on the line and the opportunity for your every need to be taken care of for life. <laughs> Tell me, is there anything more valuable than that? I didn't think so. Dead End Drive is a dark comedy novel that makes three promises. One, an illustrious estate in Louisiana. Two, an opulent dinner affair for all in attendance. And three, and most importantly of all, lots and lots of competitive murder. So if you're looking for a cozy book to settle in with for the spooky season, I've only got one question for you. Will I see you at the will reading? <laughs>